My name is Dr. Brendan O'Shea. Um, I'm a general practitioner, uh, a family doctor in Kildare. Um, I'm a lecturer in general practice in Trinity College. Um, I've recently just stepped down as medical director at KDOC, which is a GP out of ours cooperative, uh, where we often see a particular um, angle on end of life care. All this detailed discussion about death and dying is actually heavy going, I have to say. Okay. Um, um, before I came along this evening, I consulted my Ladybird book on how to address and how to uh, make, make a public speech, and it said to seek the common ground uh, with your audience, and we don't know each other at all. But we know, inevitably, every single one of us were going to die. Um, and I think you can sense that there's been a huge, there is a huge effort of consultation, uh, of legislation, which is always difficult, um, uh, of planning uh, around uh, the way that we're dying in Ireland. And I would earnestly hope that all of us will have a better experience as we go through and come to that point in our own lives. And it won't happen by accident. Uh, it will only happen if we all actually pitch in and contribute. Um, so um, we've, we're looking at some of the bigger pieces. There's some very important legislation uh, that Liam and his enlightened colleagues in Dáil Éireann have brought through. And I couldn't imagine the amount of committee time that's been involved in all of that. Good legislation doesn't happen by accident. Um, there's been a lot of legal consultation around it. Uh, another important piece is the Think Ahead tool, and that's what I'd particularly like to uh, reflect on you with and see if you think it might be relevant or helpful to yourselves. Um, so I just have some slides and I'll just work through them in terms of some of the work we've done with Think Ahead um, uh, and how, how, our, how patients have found it. Uh, my own background is in family medicine. Uh, in my own practice, we have a part-time involvement with a local palliative care team, and we provide uh, a cover in the palliative care unit from time to time and have done so for over 20 years. Um, as I've indicated, I'm a lecturer in Trinity College, and I'm also involved in the training of, of young general practitioners who also find this to be very challenging when, for the first time, they're in a training practice and they're involved in the care of a patient who's dying. And they're involved in the care of that patient often for the year. And this is new because in their hospital jobs, they rotate every three or six months and there's less chance for personal connection. So certainly young doctors find this to be challenging. And I think you can tell from Liam and my own observations, we find it challenging as well. Uh, my experience in the out of hour setting uh, particularly caused me to be really interested in Think Ahead. Uh, KDOC, if you've had to contact your GP out of hours, it's a cooperative. Uh, KDOC, there are 120 Kildare GPs involved in it. And we provide out of hours cover for about a quarter of a million people in Kildare um, uh, in the out of hours setting. And we are frequently called in in the middle of the night to the nursing homes in Kildare, where we have elderly, frail elderly patients. Um, their own doctor isn't contactable, um, and there's an uncertainty as to what that person would like. And there's very little there. And by default, that person is. Uh, uh, is transferred into the casualty department. Doctors are quite, are quite funny. Uh, very often we treat ourselves different from the way we, we treat our patients. Uh, I know when, if I'm in one of those beds in that nursing home, that is where I'm going to want to stay myself. Uh, if I happen to be lucky enough to get to be 83 with chronic renal failure, uh, a little bit of dementia, and maybe if I've survived a malignancy. Um, the nursing staff um, are fantastic for the most part. Uh, it's a comfortable environment. But certainly in the out of our setting as doctors, we find that we're, we're, we're put into these situations and it's very difficult for us, for patients and for families. Um, more relevant to this, um, uh, on the GP training scheme, uh, my younger colleagues have a requirement to do a piece of research. Um, and in 2011, we were approached by Sarah Murphy and the Hospice Foundation uh, with a view to having a look at the first edition of Think Ahead. And well, we were wildly excited about it nearly straight up. Um, and we were asked to maybe test it out in a clinical setting. Um, it was very easy. We came in after a huge amount of work and consultation had been done by the Hospice Foundation. They stole the best ideas from everywhere else across the world. Um, and they've put a huge amount of experience and design expertise into this. So we were really keen. Um, children with a new toy, etc., and so on, despite the gravity of it all. Uh, so we've, I'd like to share the results of an acceptability study we did in the general practice setting on Think Ahead and how does it work. Um, and we're also currently undertaking an interventional study in nursing homes in Kildare, and I, I would hope you might find that interesting, since a lot of us will finish up in a nursing home. Um, from a personal point of view, uh, I, I, in my own general practice work and in my own family life, uh, as I get older, it seems to me that this is just very important. Death will not go away, um, so I think we just need to face up to it. Why don't we? Why don't, why don't we think ahead? Um, doctor, we're, as doctors, we're quite good at blaming ourselves. Um, um, 
uh, and we can blame ourselves for this, how do we let this happen? Uh, within the medical profession, I think there's a cultural thing that we're not comfortable often discussing end-of-life care, particularly in the hospital setting, but maybe less so in general practice. Uh, it's a painful thing, so we, we tend to naturally avoid painful things. Uh, we're busy, um, and I'm afraid as we're all trying to work harder and smarter with less, the busyness is, is, it just gets worse. Uh, end-of-life care requires discussion, and it requires time, and it requires comfort to have that discussion in. The Think Ahead tool is very clever at addressing that. Um, there are legal uncertainties uh, that we find difficult, so we leave them off till the last minute. Um, End-of-life care isn't a core professional value in the medical system. So if you're a diabetic, we're lovely to, we, we really like having you, and we'll focus in on your parameters, and we'll get your blood pressure under control, and we'll get your HbA1c under control, but we still don't want to talk about dying. We really pretend that that's never going to happen to you. But arguably, when anybody is diagnosed with diabetes, or breast cancer, or if they've had a heart attack, uh, and they survive these things as they increasingly do. Overall, their probabilities are different in life, and these are good opportunities that they should take out, think ahead, and consider it, and fill it out, and go through it. Um, Liam challenged you to uh, go home and consider making out your own advance directive uh, and to ensure that you've got a will made this evening. And when you've that done this evening, then I think you should fill out, think ahead for yourself as well. Um, I suppose another issue in our societies, is, and, and doctors are the same as everybody else in this regard, we're not quite sure when we should think ahead, so we don't. So we procrastinate, and then suddenly you're on the trolley in the casualty department. Life is like that. Why do we need to think ahead? Um, it avoids uh, additional uncertainty. Uh, the Buddhists would have it uh, that the worst suffering comes from uncertainty. Uh, that if we separate from all the people that we love and the life that we have, that it's just intolerably painful to consider it. Uh, however, experience would suggest that if you do engage with it and if you do go through the process of think ahead, uh, it, it closes down the uncertainty and reduces the suffering. It's ugly, but true to say that if we have better advanced uh, uh, planning uh, and better end-of-life uh, planning, it will reduce costs. Um, I'm not going to dwell on it, but it's terribly expensive when any of us wander into the acute hospital setting, we immediately start clocking up huge costs. It is far less expensive, and I would put it to you, it's far more comfortable to be in our own bed or to be in a nursing home uh, where there are just absolutely smashing nurses sta nursing staff wherever they came from, the Philippines or India or County Mayo, I don't know where they come from, uh, but it's much better and less expensive to be looked after there. That's a fact of the matter. Um, overall, uh, the potential to alleviate suffering is enormous. And in my practice for over 20 years, um, I've been privileged to care for people over a long period of time. We're all marching towards that point in, my, in, in our lives. And it seems to me that those individuals who have given some thought to this and have discussed it with their family have a much easier experience. And their family certainly have a much easier experience afterwards. So we just want to formalize that and make that experience available to more people. And think ahead is a key tool in all of that. Um, I suppose a last reason, <clears throat> and in this terrible Ireland that we're now living in, uh, post the Celtic Tiger crash, um, you're actually uh, not enjoyed to have any. You're not allowed to have any positive experiences anymore. Uh, we're not allowed uh, to feel good about things. Um, things have gotten so difficult. But in actual fact, uh, when you do go through the process and you reflect on your life. Um, uh, very often it's quite a positive experience. Um, I, my own personal on that is, is my mum uh, did it. And uh, being a typical Irish family, uh, there's four of us in the family and my two parents. Uh, the other three all emigrated, so I was left with my two parents. And uh, uh, Mammy asked me, look, I, I really need to make a will. And my immediate response was to phobically stand back. You are going to live forever. I couldn't possibly go there. But she asked me a couple of times, and then reluctantly I engaged in it. And this was the late 1990s. So we sat down on three occasions, and each one became funnier and more enjoyable than the next. Um, she, she did sit back. She had all her bits and pieces. And sometimes the, most, the biggest upset happens over the smallest things, the bloody jewellery, okay? <laughs> the assets, okay? The plot of land, the house, the furniture, I don't know what. Um, but we went through everything. And uh, her feeling at the end of it was, God, actually, I did quite a fair bit. Um, I was in close communication with my three siblings in Canada, uh, so we were all on the same page, and it was actually a really good day's work. The wrong time to do this is in the casualty department. The time to do this is... Somebody whispered now. 
now is the time to do it, tonight, okay, or in the next week. Um, but sorry, but enough of this faffing around. Okay, so when do we do it? How can you go about it? And where, 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 where do you have the conversations? Um, I've reflected on the personal experience, uh, but we're on the basis of the research that we've done um, on the training scheme and in, and in Trinity, um, we, we are strongly advocating systematic use of Think Ahead. It, we, we just deserve better than hit or miss. I'm a bit annoyed with all the Americans, the 40% the of them who've all got this done. And you can tell everybody over 50 in America almost certainly has got this done. But I suspect very few of us have here. And there are a few of us over 50, I do believe. Um, so think ahead. Um, it's an innovative end-of-life planning tool. It is an advanced care directive, but it's an awful lot more than that. It's the big enchilada. It's got everything in it. There's a lot of detail in it, but it's very well laid out. So it will do advanced care planning. It will prompt you to make a will. It will prompt you to consider uh, your funeral arrangements. It will prompt you to consider who's to be told what and when. Um, so it's a very complete tool and it's very easy to navigate. And it is under constant development. And some of the research that we did uh, in 2011-2012 is reflected in the current edition. So it's been tried in a group of Irish patients and their experience that they very kindly put into the process is reflected. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great piece of kit. This is what one of the key. This is this is what the layout looks at, looks like, um, and it's very logically laid out uh, in sections that are actually quite easy to understand. Key information, care preferences, the legal aspects, the financial. When I die, what's going to happen that day, um, and sharing of information. Um, so one of the studies we did was a feasibility study in 2011-2012. We got the first edition. We took it into general practice. We decided that we'd give it to 100 patients in five practices. They were going to be stable patients with nothing much wrong with them. Um, they were in for a blood pressure check or my HRT prescription uh, or I've got to get my driving license form filled or whatever. Uh, so if you were having a heart attack in the surgery, we didn't give it to you that day. Okay? Um, anything can happen in general practice, but fortunately most patients are reasonably well attending. Think Ahead was given to them. They were advised we were doing a piece of research. Uh, we asked them to fill it out. We encouraged them to talk about it to their best friend, whoever that was. And we advised them that they'd get a telephone survey at one week and three weeks to see how you were getting on with it. We were a bit devious about it. Uh, we felt that a one-week uh, telephone reminder was important to get them to finish it out, uh, that it could have been parked under the Evening Herald or the Irish Times initially, but we wanted to provide a bit of encouragement for them to complete it. The aim of the study was to evaluate patient acceptability and perceived usefulness. Was this useful? And to see whether there were any ways that it could be refined. An observational study, five practices on the training scheme. We obtained ethical approval from the Training Scheme Ethics Committee. We did a small pilot study with 15 patients, refined the survey a little bit, and then we, we, we went ahead. Um, and these were the people that we gave it to. They were provided with, so you came into, your, into the practice, you got an information sheet advising the study was on. Uh, you were invited to opt out if you'd like to, and nobody did. Um, clinically unstable patients were excluded. Informed written consent was obtained, and then we conducted telephone surveys. The questions we asked in the survey, well, did you read it? Did you complete it? Did you find any parts of it to be difficult or upsetting? And these are important things if you think you're going to go home and give it to Granny or Granddad or Auntie Mary. Uh, was it of interest for you to fill it out? Did you discuss it with anyone? And that's a very important metric for this kind of tool. As I've referred to, there are tools like this in other healthcare systems, and one of the ways that these are judged to be successful or not is whether the patient feels comfortable discussing it. I've been given this, I will discuss it with somebody else. So engagement with family uh, is known to be an important indicator whether the thing is effective or not. Uh, was it okay to be given Think Ahead when you were coming in for your blood pressure prescription? Um, and would you like this to be on the internet or would you prefer paper? Skipping ahead, everybody preferred paper. That probably reflects the fact that we're an older crew. The results, uh, we got a reasonable sample and as we, as we expected, there were uh, 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 some more uh, ladies rather than gentlemen in the sample which re would reflect a general practice population. Uh, the mix of medical card eligible versus private was as we would expect, so we know that our sample was reasonably representative of the man and indeed the woman on the street. Um, first question, should Think Ahead be more widely introduced? Uh, so um, 97 completed the survey. The vast majority of those, 86%, felt it should be. We've read it, we've done it, we really think it should be more widely introduced. Was it difficult to understand? And we're quite funny about this. Uh, we legals and medical people, often we think, gosh, patients won't be able for this. But of course, that's patronizing nonsense. Uh, people are actually well able to make decisions when they're well laid out. 
63%, uh, so over 6 out of 10 reported no difficulty in filling out this folder about me dying. I had no difficulty with it. Uh, a minority indicated some difficulty around these issues. The principal area that caused difficulty was, well, I don't understand the issues around CPR and ventilation. Uh, some responders indicated legal stuff was challenging and the key information was challenging. So the new edition of, of Think Ahead has additional explanatory information about this and where better to take these queries back to than your own general practitioner. Uh, should it be changed? Um, uh, over 8 out of 10 said it was just fine the way it was, um, which I think is probably remarkable. Um, there were some suggestions for change and some change has been introduced. Uh, people or groups that should be advised uh, at the time of the person's death should be expanded on. How often the Think Ahead document should be reviewed. Uh, church or religious organisations should be notified as well. Um, key, key metric, has reading this caused you to discuss your end of life with family? A minority, 15%, said it didn't. Well, 85% said it did. Uh, uh, um, uh, almost a half were very clear that they clearly discussed end of life in detail, um, and a smaller proportion indicated somewhat. So this is a really good tool for starting the discussion and finishing it. Key question, was it upsetting? Three quarters reported they did not find Think Ahead was upsetting. Did this upset you? No, it didn't. A quarter indicated some part caused upset. Before we get carried away with this, uh, I would have to juxtapose this quarter reporting some upset with the anguish and the distress that um, Liam and I would be very familiar with as family doctors when these decisions are not made and decisions are made uh, in haste in the agony of a terminal event. It's upsetting to discuss it. I think it's remarkable that three quarters indicated that this didn't cause the, uh, upset. Some sample responses here were the idea of organ donation and switching off the life support machines was upsetting. Uh, when you're sick, you might feel differently about the choices you've made compared to when you feel well. Were there any areas you found difficult about this? Uh, six out of 97 indicated making the will was difficult, details around dying was difficult, finance, three of them indicated, and three indicated issues around CPR. How much better it is to discuss these when you're relatively well, how difficult these are to discuss when you're dying. Um, would completing this document be of interest to other people? 65% uh, were forthright and said yes, 21% had no opinion and 4% said no it wouldn't. So there's a strong consensus here that this is a good thing. Uh, should, should it be introduced more widely? 86% indicated yes. So the study we did, it was modest. Um, there, there were strengths to the study. Uh, we got a good varied sample of men and women, medical card private patients, good age spread. There was clearly very good engagement. People were very happy to fill it out and complete it and give feedback. In general practice, we found it fitted in very well. And when we discussed this with our colleagues, the first response is, my God, you couldn't give this to patients. They'll be coming back to us for weeks asking us what's this and what's that and what's the other. The reality is that just didn't happen at all, um, that the tool is very self-explanatory. And particularly when somebody discusses it with somebody else, they reach good conclusions. Um, so this was a very good fit with general practice. And we do believe that general practice is a good place to make this available, maybe to give it out systematically. Um, and it doesn't certainly bend us out of shape and it doesn't mess up our workload, which is important to us. Weaknesses of the study, uh, we asked a small number of questions. Um, the sampling, it was only 100, and there may be a response bias. The doctor who gave out the Think Ahead document was the doctor who called the patient up, and patients are actually really nice. They don't like upsetting their doctor, and so there might have been a positive response bias. I don't know. Um, so we're presently conducting another study, and this time we've done an educational intervention with all of the doctors in Kildare, with the nursing homes, and we've gone into five of the nursing homes um, and done an educational intervention with the nursing home staff. We've measured the percentage of files that have clear end-of-life planning recorded in them uh, in a sample of 500 patients, and it's frighteningly small. And we're going back in four months' time to see if we can increase that. Uh, so that's where that study is, and it's progressing reasonably well. Uh, we're also considering uh, planning a blended learning pack to help doctors and nurses engage in these conversations more easily. Um, and in terms of some of these bigger questions, uh, we strongly support the Forum and the Hospice Foundation and yourselves in discussing this. We need to keep on discussing it until more of the pieces are in place. Uh, based on our own research, we feel that uh, everybody over 50 should be invited to fill out Think Ahead, and we think probably general practice is a good place to do it, and there are other good places to do it. We feel that everybody who has a significant medical diagnosis should be asked to consider Think Ahead, not on the day of the diagnosis, but maybe at the six or 12 week visit. 
we feel that it should be part of good chronic disease management and that when you're over 50 and you're hypertensive, you definitely should fill it out. We feel that any patient who's being admitted to a nursing home, to a supported care environment, it should be part of the six or 12 week follow up. We feel that the best place to do it is in the company of a friend or family member with relevant input from professional advisors and particularly with sustained input from the GP who's very well placed to assist and guide you as your circumstances change. So patients are well able to fill this out. You'll be well able to fill it out. It's an absolutely fantastic tool. It's a very valuable piece of intellectual property and it's free. Um, general practice is a suitable place and we, we would hope that you'd feel comfortable coming in to discuss it with us. Thank you very much.